Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont show. I'm Bruce Wilson, the Executive Director of um, Service Render Incorporated. And Straight Talk Vermont is one of our programs for many years, and the cable show is part of it. And I want to make a couple announcements. So those of you who've been to the University Mall and noticed that we have a big red curtain in front of our Art So Wonderful Gallery, it's because we're renovating it. And we're very happy about that. Um, we're going to make it look real nice, nicer in there. And, um, you know, so we can we take it off all these shelves in there that's, and put some flat screens on the wall where you can, you know, we can view the uh, art better. And then we'll have some events in it as well. So uh, stay tuned for that opening to be, and I keep changing the date, but I think it's going to be at the end of the March this time. <laughs> um, and so I'm here with my very special guest today. And our name is um, Mara Collins from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. How you doing, Mara? I'm very good. So happy to be Thank here with you. Thank you very much. We're talking about my favorite subject. Oh, uh, yeah. We're talking about affordable housing. And so let's talk about affordable housing. Now, <clears throat> now this is, so you... There is none. End there, of show. That's damn right. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> there is no for <laughs> Mara. <laughs> Dang, we, you're right. So let me ask you a question, though. Um, Affordable housing, um, what, what is it? For, first of all, I, don't, I think it's just a, like a good way of saying that, you know, we, we, we believe in affordable housing and within our agency, not, just, not your agency, but everybody who was working on so-called using the word affordable housing. Because what is it really? How is that so? How can you come up with that? What's the ratio on, like, you know, from the, you know, I'm trying to say with the rich, um, real estate to yeah. the poor. Now that's now how how that fit in affordable housing mixed in with the uh, high end places or housing or how that, how does it work? I don't, yeah, it um, it's always the first question I'm asked, and it's such a good one because it's so fundamental. We all use the term affordable housing, but what do we mean? And uh, really, I like to throw people off their game to say there is every single house in Vermont is affordable if you're a gazillionaire. You know what I mean? Right. If Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or whoever were to show up and want to buy something, right. something tells me they would not have any trouble. Um, but for the rest of us, not all the housing's affordable. And so what we do is we use a really overly simplistic, problematic, academic standard of what's affordable. We say 30% of households income should go to their housing plus their utilities. Oh, wow. So we all have different incomes, and mm -hmm. so we all have um, different number of homes that we'd call affordable and different price points that would be affordable. And we don't just all have different incomes. We'd all have different things going on in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I have three young children. I have high child care costs. That means maybe 30% isn't the right number for me. Right. Maybe I need to spend a little less. Maybe I spend more on transportation or healthcare costs. And so what's affordable to me is gonna further be lower and lower number, meaning there's less and less homes that are affordable to me. So we really look at that difference between what uh, folks are earning and what they can afford. <laughs> That's kind of tricky. It's but really I, it makes sense, you know, 30% um, uh, is, um, I, thought, I think that's pretty high. Uh, maybe not, though. It's interesting. It, the number used to be 20%, mm -hmm. and then the feds moved it to 25%, and then they moved it to 30%. Mm. And of, of your, you of know your why? income, right? Yeah, and it's because they didn't want to pay so much in rental assistance. Oh, that program, the Section 8 program at the time, was getting too expensive, mm -hmm. and at the time, uh, renters had to pay 20% of their income toward their rent and the federal government, HUD, paid the rest in their Section 8 program. And then that cost too much. They said, you can afford to pay 25%. And that went on for a while. And it, it's been many, many, many decades since it got shifted to 30%. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, it's not the right number for everyone. And so what we do is we look at, all right, how much are people earning? What's the median income? If we sorted all incomes in order and picked the middle point, you know, how much could they afford and how many homes are renting at that price point or on the market to be purchased at that price point. And right now, there are not very yeah. many. Yeah. So we're talking about affordable housing. Um, so um, <clears throat> then once again, I got to talk about that a little bit more because 
Um, when you when you when you uh, go over people's income, right? That's what you do. You go over income, and so okay, here's thirty percent of your income based on all these other things you have to do to um, to live. Your systemic stuff you need. Um, so, but there is a point where is that your your um, rate of pay don't go up, and but the housing go up. Everything goes up, but your thirty percent. I mean, how much? You know, I mean, your your rate of pay. So how how. You know, so how can you afford any any place? You know, yes. seem like it. You know, because there is no place like that. Seem like it, but it probably is. I don't know. Yeah, and that is what we've seen, especially in Chittenden County, where I don't have the numbers in front of me, but from the '80s, we've looked at you know how much pay has gone up on average every year, and um, oh gosh, I think the number is like two and a half percent a year. And then rental prices wow. have gone up 4% and homeownership prices have gone up 5%, you know, and I, I don't have those numbers right. exactly sure. right, but I do know that the housing costs are going up far bigger. And so if you were to graph it out, it's like the yawning jaws of an alligator, you know, the, the difference between incomes and house prices are getting farther and farther apart from each other. And so if you're renting, housing is becoming less and less affordable every year and your rent may go up some year and you can't afford it anymore and you need to move and where are you going to go to with the vacancy rate being what it is there's not a lot of apartments out there homeowners have it a little easier in that if they get a fixed rate mortgage then their home prices largely, their, their mortgage stays the same for 30 years. Now, their taxes go up, their utilities may go up, other things may change, but that is one reason why a lot of people decide, you know what, I need to hop off the roller coaster that is the rental housing market and try to move on to being a homeowner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important to be a homeowner. You know, I think, well, a lot of people well, it's important based on all the things you just said, but I think also a lot of people just don't want to be, some people just don't want to be a homeowner. Yeah. Owner. So they, that's the choice, you know. So with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, you are the executive director. How many, um, are you, is, what, is it statewide? It is statewide. We were in the early 70s, um, and late 60s, there was um, a new, uh, investment opportunity that the federal government came up with and they said every state can um, can use these tax-exempt bonds and finance affordable housing with them but the state of Vermont and every other state in the nation needed to pick an agency to administer that program and so in 1974 the legislature created us and so we are we were created by statute and the governor appoints our board and the board then hires me and I hire the rest of the staff. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise we really don't have a lot of connection to state government. Mm -hmm. We aren't state employees. We don't get state appropriations every year. We aren't reliant on the state budget or anything like that. We operate completely separately and all the risk of our investments are on our own. We're not, wow. um, we're not under the ratings of the state um, fully. We instead, uh, sell these tax-exempt bonds mm -hmm. and we live off that those investment earnings as a way of supporting our work large part so uh, <clears throat> wow so I mean you tell me no taxpayers don't give like a dollar or nothing we don't get direct appropriations or, or, um, last year was one of the first times um, the state wanted us to start up a really innovative weatherization program for renters and owners to button up their homes and uh, they did give us some appropriations to start up that one program but we don't get any kind of ongoing support oh, wow. from the state wow, in that wow, way wow. wow personally I just I think you should you know I think you should get some type of funding from People. Well, but the system works the way we have it. I okay. mean, there is there is a Department of Housing um, mm -hmm. within the state, and there's a state housing trust fund that funds housing and conservation that another organization administers. That So the state is contributing to housing, just not through VHFA directly. Mm -hmm. There are other um, things the state has done, though. There's a state housing tax credit, and we're able to sell those tax credits to fund affordable housing. It all gets really complicated really quickly, which is also probably part of the problem, is that a lot of this isn't really 
straightforward. All right. So do you sell the tax credits to individual banks? Uh, banks and insurance companies and they uh, can write off, it's called the bank franchise fee, mm -hmm. banks have to pay a tax on how much they have in deposits and they take a tax credit off that tax bill that they have, that tax liability. And so instead they in invest in affordable housing, which is a mm -hmm. great thing. So do you guys do that? Do you invest in, do you build homes? You we have, um, we work on the homeownership side and the rental side. For homeownership, we're a mortgage lender. So if you're within our income limits and you want to buy a home within our purchase price limits, then you wouldn't go to VHFA. We don't have branches across state. Instead, the bank. we work with participating lenders, credit unions, mortgage companies, banks, and you'd walk into one of those and you'd say, Here's my info, here's the kind of home I want to buy. And they would say, you qualify for a VHFA loan. And we offer up to $15,000 in down payment assistance. So it's a pretty good deal. That's and uh, so that, that bank or credit union will do the mortgage with you. And then after that mortgage closes, they turn around and sell that loan to us. Um, on the rental side, we don't make loans to individuals who are trying to rent uh, an apartment but instead we give giant loans and these tax credits to developers of affordable rental housing and so there's a there's a whole network of affordable housing developers the Champlain Housing Trust and the Cathedral Square Corporation locally are some nonprofits there's also Summit Development Group and Snyder companies some for-profit developers we have a lot of developers and builders who come to us and mm -hmm. get millions of dollars in loans, and that helps build the building that becomes the affordable <laughs> apartments. Yeah, I know that affordable still kills. Get me a little bit. I know, don't get it as well as I don't want to. Um, so, um, weatherization. Um, <clears throat> what exactly? I, I used to sit on the board of directors for CBOEO, and I know they had a weather, weatherization program. But what what do you guys what it, what's that about? What you for you guys? What kind of work do you do for within that? Yeah, CVOEO and statewide, I believe there's six weatherization um, assistance program uh, administrators locally, and that weatherization program weatherizes homes for people who are lower income. There's an income threshold. Again, we look at we always judge everything by where the median income is, and that serves people at 80% of that median income. So that's the, the mm -hmm. bottom part of, um, of homeowners. The program we were asked to stand up goes above that and serves people who earn 80% of median up to 120% of median income. So we're trying to hit kind of more modest income Vermonters because there's a lot of homes that need weatherizing and are poor quality uh, and folks are not they don't earn the kind of money that they can just go get a loan or pay for it on their own. They still need some help, but they um, don't need it all paid for for free through the weatherization assistance program. So we're working with Efficiency Vermont, and they are providing grant money to help pay for, let's say, half the cost of the project. And the other half, these households um, can uh, get a, a loan for, but it's not a loan to them. I, we wouldn't look at, you know, your income, your credit rating, your assets, anything like that. We instead look at the home and we say, is this home really need to be weatherized? And if their utility bills are really high, then it qualifies for uh, this program. And what happens is you pay that back over time on your utility bill. Mm -hmm. So we're working with Vermont Gas and all um, <clears throat> a lot of the electric companies in the state so that you pay this back over the long term. It makes it more affordable. Mm -hmm. So do you, uh, <clears throat> do you, part of this, I don't know, you, you should, you might know, um, you should know. <laughs> uh, replace windows, you do that, or, or help repair foundation. A lot of, um, uh, you know, what am I trying to say, a lot of, problems occur through like wind and weather problems come through the windows, foundation, walls, and even even needing um, tuck pointing on your house or 
you play sight, sight, sighting? Yeah. Do you, you do you do any? That that's part of the weatherization program. You're you're exactly right that that's where the needs are, and weatherization often doesn't include those things. It's looking more at. Um, insulation, air sealing, things like that. So around your windows, but not necessarily new windows. Mm -hmm. But what we often find is that a home that needs weatherization mm -hmm. also needs those other kind of repairs you're talking about. Foundation work, you know, new roof, something like oh, that. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is work. There are revolving loan funds in the state that are available to folks. Um, and these loan funds are really affordable and they're income targeted to folks. We're trying to figure out how to marry these weatherization funds with those programs and bring them together so that uh, at once a home could not only get their weatherization work done, but also the health and safety, the, the rest of the work that may need to be done on the home. Hmm. Wow, this, this just seemed like, um, I mean, you guys do a lot, because I mean, um, how many offices do you have? Just one. Just one. And frankly, we're not using it very much right, right now. Right in Burlington. Yeah, right here in Burlington. Um, well, it's and like five floors in that place or something like that. No, nope, there are three floors, and a lot of people are working remotely, so it's okay. it's pretty empty right now. But we have 40 employees, mm -hmm. and we've been around, well, next month, we'll turn 48 years old. Wow. Yeah. Check that out. That's good. Um, so... <clears throat> So um, I know you guys do a lot, of, a lot of things, and you partner with a lot of organizations. Like, who do you partner? Do you partner with? Who do you partner with? Other, so um, I guess more of agencies that do similar work, or ones that um, that do just different types of work that can that need your service, like um, like um, community action or things, please people like that. Or do you you partner with you partner with community actions and? Um, I can't think of some of the names when that comes in my head, but um, who do you... Who's well, it's that? easy, because my answer is, we'll partner with anyone. Mm -hmm. We are agnostic. We, we want to... Housing impacts everything. It impacts where our jobs are and how uh, economically vibrant the state is. It impacts our health care outcomes. It impacts uh, the wear and tear on our roads and bridges and our school systems. There's always a link back to housing. So um, we partner with our congressional delegation and federal partners like HUD and Rural Development, because that's where the money's coming from, frankly. So we're always going to want to partner with them. Yeah. And we have just such support from all those federal partners. Mm -hmm. We partner with other statewide agencies that either have money or set policy around housing. So there's a, the governor has a Department of Housing and Community Development we work a lot with. There's a agency very similar to us, but they do slightly different things, that has a mission of both housing and conservation, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. And we partner with them a lot. There's a state housing authority that runs the Section 8 program. We partner with them a lot because we may uh, help fund to build the building that's affordable, but then sometimes folks still need that Section 8 voucher to make it affordable. And then there's all the municipalities that we work with. There's a lot of housing commissions. We, we get really involved in helping um, to guide what planning and zoning should be. Because we may say we need more housing, but if the local community hasn't set up their community to be housing ready, then all the money in the world isn't going to fix it. But then there's the community organizations like you were talking about. You could focus on lots of... Um, uh, demographics or situations that there's whole partners we work with so we do a lot of work to prioritize our money um, so at the apartments we finance are targeted to people experiencing homelessness so we do work with all the community action agencies and the homeless shelters and service agencies and designate agencies who are serving people without homes. We also work a lot with manufactured home communities. People call them, you know, mobile home parks. And uh, so we, 8% um, of the state's housing are manufactured homes. And so it's important that we know what's happening there, both individual um, developments, what's happening, and sort of broader statewide policy. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I mean... So let's talk, I, you know, I just want to hear your opinion, you know. Um, so I live in Winnipeg. I have a lot of opinions, so we're going to be here a while. They're going right. <laughs> I'm with the right person, too. So I live in Winnipeg, right? Yep. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> and um, 
They're doing a lot of things right there. It's a lot of incredible things. I work with the, the mayor, Mayor Christina, a lot. And others. I uh, also am on the school board um, uh, for anti racism committee. I'm the Winsky um, <clears throat> Democratic chairman. Um, I've just been appointed by the governor, Shelman, to be uh, the uh, human rights commissioner, one of, one of them. That. Um, and so, um, and so I'm sure some other things I do, but I, <laughs> I got to look at my own damn resume. <laughs> Um, so anyways, but there's an issue that's been around there that, um, a, 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 a person, um, who owned this property, 300 Main Street, has e got eviction notices going out to, I think it's 24 families on, um, Lee, you gotta go, um, <clears throat> cause he wanna make it, he wanna make more money, that's all, basically what he's saying, cause he just wanna make it more luxurious and charge more money, that's what he says. So I guess that means you want to make more money. So now, here it is, families, um, not individuals, families, you know what I mean? And then they all targeted our new Americans. You know, so, oh, so are you guys, a, I know um, the mayor and the Winooski Housing Authority and our others are working tirelessly to try to figure out what the hell they're gonna do. But for me, a lot of them is gonna be those families and youth <clears throat> are gonna be displaced. Mm -hmm. Displaced meaning that they're gonna be not be around their friends, families. They're not gonna be um, be able to go to our schools, we don't see schools, and not gonna be around. You know, um, do the things that they they all normally those normally new Americans who who lives in those together know each other and they um, they depend on each other for something. You know. So what do you think about that um, being evicted? Twenty four families because. I'm, but these are my words because they won't make more money. But that was their words too because they want to bring it up nice and and um, and, and make more money. So, so what do you think about that? Um, but just being evicted um, and nowhere to go. This is like all of a sudden, boom, you got to go. You know, and, it know. is absolutely heartbreaking. It it is so hard to imagine, especially in this market, mm -hmm. uh, that these families are going to have to try to find new places to live. And, you know, we've been financing rental buildings for 40 some odd years. And I can tell you that after 25, 30 years, it's not unusual that buildings need a big renovation. I mean, housing, um, especially rental housing, it gets banged up. You know, you get people moving in and out every couple of years. And so it is very fair that we need to, I would call it recapitalize, put more money into housing. Um, and make sure it's meeting the needs of the market. You know, mm -hmm. we all have walked through or seen pictures of homes that are quite outdated and not meeting today's needs. Um, so, so that's fair. But there are ways to do this, to invest in housing uh, that mm -hmm. does not evict everyone all at once, flooding the market and raising the rents um, by so much and all that. So. That is one reason why it's so important that the programs, that the, the government subsidized affordable housing programs like VHFA administers would never allow for that. You know, we have restrictions about how housing needs to remain affordable. So it's really exciting that we have just under 14,000 apartments statewide that are, I would say, are. I would use a capital A and capital H. They're affordable housing, meaning they got some kind of government subsidy. Like I said, we all have a different definition of what's affordable, but I'm saying, you know, VHFA or the state um, and somehow feds were involved in making about 14,000 apartments affordable. And for those, they cannot do what um, is being done in Winooski. And so there are so many people rallying, though, about this. And that just speaks so much to the heart of Winooski in that there are a lot of communities across this country where when this happened, a community would say, ooh, my tax rolls are going to go up. I'm going to, you know, the value of this property is going to increase, meaning I can, I can get more in tax revenues. And they'd be happy to see this kind of investment. Winooski is taking a very different approach to say, we are worried about the people of Winooski who are impacted here, these 24 families. And so there are so many people working so hard on this issue. Uh, housing Authority and the local housing providers, and I know that the um, 
refugee resettlement uh, agencies gotten involved and, and at the, the little bit of silver lining is that um, there are a lot of people who are working very hard to try to help this situation. Yeah, it's kind of weird because um, they got that, um, I think a lot of tenants have, um, you know, they can uh, raise your rent and evict, evict you like when they feel like it. Um, I had a building in Chicago that finally sold and, um, and this was in Chicago and like a person that we were trying to get the person out because I would never pay rent and so, so you just can't throw them out, you can't turn off the lights, you can't change the locks, you can't do none of those things. So you just have to go to court, right? And so there you go, you got to pay the court card. So I um, went to Chicago to go to court, you know, to try to see if we can um, find some, get that person out of there actually and not evict that person. And, um, and the judge told me, she said, Mr. Wilson, I am so happy you flew from Vermont <laughs> to all the way to Chicago, but you can't handle this. You got to have an attorney. You can't do this yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so there's all the time that money right there was all here go messed up, right? And then, um, and then we still have to uh, upkeep the building and oil and this, that, and other. And then, um, so I had to hire an attorney. And I often went back up there the next time. I kind of flew up there because I still got family and friends up there. That was one of a good reason for me to go. And to, to meet with the attorney <clears throat> at the, in the court building, and so so when we went to the court. You know, the, the, the court time is one o'clock or whatever. N it never happens. And so I'm sitting there with the attorney in the court, and I'm um, waiting on our attorney to come up, and um, for like two hours. And then the, um, the judge. We finally got to the judge, and the judge said, um, "Well, the person is not here. You know, the the, the, the tenant tenant is not here, and so let's give her another chance." So, meanwhile, it's cost me $250 an hour to pay this attorney. He's sitting in the courtroom for two hours. We laugh and talking, and, he, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, he, I, if I was him, I'd be laughing and talking, too. And, um, and then it happened again. Yeah. So, I'm, so all the money that I was out of to get that tenant out of there, $250 an hour for an attorney. And now, and now I, and of course, I'm looking at it at the bargain basement for an attorney, and that was like the, one of the cheapest rates. And I had to pay this rate while sitting there with this guy and I'm flying in Chicago from Vermont. And I'm like, wow, with tennis rights, they really have some tennis rights here. Mm -hmm. And so here, you could, these people don't get nothing. They, you got to go. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, every, every state is different. Mm -hmm. uh, and Vermont does have fairly robust landlord-tenant um, laws that, that protect tenants. Uh, but situations like this yeah, are beautiful. possible and like I said it is heartbreaking mm -hmm. there's a lot of resources to explain to tenants what their rights are through CVOEO they run a statewide landlord tenant program um, and called Vermont tenants and they have uh, explanations of what landlords rights are and tenants rights they've even put it in like a graphic novel format they've translated it into lots of different languages so trying to get that information out to people to know what's possible but at the end of the day this is still possible I know it's like it's incredible I, I never think they can do that but they, obviously they can't hear in Vermont um, <clears throat> so um, is it kind of weird how things happen you know like um, in Chicago where I was born and raised, um, like Maya was part of the civil rights movement with the SCLC, Operation Bradbass, Operation Push, National, you know, NWCP, you know, all these people that I work with. I worked with uh, Jesse Jackson and his wife Jackie has come to my house in, in Mirahan, Washington, because my mother was like a big shot in the, in the movie and, and things she did in the, in the world. And, um, and so I always felt for our civil rights are always false for equity and inclusion and the diversity and justice. Mm -hmm. So that's like been all my life, mm -hmm. you know. And when I came in Vermont, when 89 was the whitest state in America, I think it might be the second or something, um, which is all right. Obviously, um, I came in 89, so, you know, I honestly ain't got nothing against some white people because I would be here this long. But anyways, um, so I told my mother I was coming to Vermont and she said, good, good, because I just come up there when I was a young person. And they said, good, good, you're going to make a difference. And I thought she probably meant that for civil rights, prior because um, I'm African American, and that um, I'll make a difference because there is not many who looks like me and, and the person who was grow, grew up, brought up 
um, to believe in, you know, inclusion and equity and working together, everybody. Yeah. And um, and so one year I said, Mom, Mom, uh, <laughs> she said I was gonna make a difference. She said, You, I said, Mom, I'm making, I'm make, I made a difference. She said, What you do, boy? What you do? And I said, Vermont is the second whitest state now in America. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, She said, you know. It was funny. She said, boy, I told you it was going to make a difference. There you go. <laughs> I know. Single-handedly doubled the rate of uh, your community or your neighborhood. Maybe. I know. I like, I'd be somewhere in front. I'd like, damn, look at what they think. It's five, five mm -hmm. black people in the same room at the same time. Yeah. But anyway, so but since Floyd and um, Black Lives Matter and police differences with people of color, um, people around the world thought they should hire people who can... Um, work in the areas of um, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and um, all these, and everybody, <laughs> every company just about have hired these people to work on these issues. Um, and so, a um, couple things. Um, so what do you, so how do you, how do you think that that's gonna make a difference? Because it's like, a lot of, a lot of people, um, for instance, I, I'm listening to an example of Use myself as an example. I, um, I'm part of the Vermont State Police Fair and Partial Policing, um, and that's for everybody. For Fair and Partial Policing, and I work with the community part too, and and they got it all in their website and everything like that. Like for instance, Burlington, they, they're not Vermont State Police, but they're Burlington Police. We were talking about data collection for people stopped, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and in that time it was zero point one percent of African Americans live in the state. But Burlington had the nerves to stop 85% of people who look like me in the state. 85%, man. And then we're only 0.1%. How, how's that? And they got this fair parts of police, and they don't think it's, they don't have to think it had nothing to do with um, um, like racism. They don't think it had nothing to, that's not, that have nothing to do with it. We come, quite frankly, that have a lot to do with it, mm -hmm. right? And so when you talk about fair and parts of uh, when you're talking about um, equity and inclusion, like no more in the back rooms, no more of a, um, let's work together, let's make sure we bring people who look like Bruce or BIPOC in the back rooms, or not in the back room, just bring, get rid of the back room, just bring them to may help make these, or, they, or ask them, what do you think about this, Bruce? Right. You know, just, give me, just give me an idea what you think, I'm thinking about it, you know? Yeah. And um, so I do, when you think that um, people are just like, hiring all these positions just because they say they got them or, you know, or things going to change? Uh, it depends on the day and my mood about if I think this is a wonderful investment, long overdue and really impressive because, uh, you know, we, we've followed suit. We've done that in the last couple of years. And in doing so, um, the idea was we didn't just want to make commitments that said we're going to do X, Y, and Z and not put our money where our mouth was. It was important that I pay a good amount of money to people to say this is your job. This is you know what you will be held accountable to and their job is to hold the rest of the agency accountable to these commitments. And if we don't have a internal accountability like that, then we're never going to meet those commitments that we put down on paper and set a press release about. So, um, so I do think it's an important step. I also think that the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and I think that um, this has been over 400 years in the making and it's not going to change in two years. And the, it seems to be moving very slowly. Um, and in the internal work I've done, I keep reading, don't try to move too fast that it's performative or it's not real or that you haven't brought people along and engaged with the people directly served. So um, in many ways, it is this constant push-pull of we don't want to do too much without making sure we have that feedback loop of people who are directly impacted by these programs and these initiatives. We want to make sure we're hearing their voices directly and that they have authority and agency in their voice. And that just means a much more deliberative process, a slower process, because we have to revolutionize what we've been doing. I mean, the title of my agency is Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And housing 
and finance were two key tools that we used in this nation to systemically keep people who look like you away from communities that looked a lot more like me. And so it is hard, deep work that starts with the people doing the work and changing their own hearts and minds, looking at the policies, the programs, the practices, shifting the money, seeding power. I mean, this is a revolution. And so it's, um, you, you're never gonna have a revolution by hiring a DEI director, uh, just, but you're not gonna have a revolution without doing some of those things either. Well, well, first and foremost, too, is that, um, you know, it's, I, I, know how, I know how to get people to understand more, people who don't look like me, about persons who do look like me, and how to, um, so that's the whole thing about it. It's education and understanding. And, and um, it's not about, you know, you need to bring Bruce up to the front table, you, you know, because bringing me to, but what you need to do is like, um, like you say, hire them, hire people like me, and get, get their ideas about what, well, how do you think we should move forward from these issues based on, for, all, for everybody, right? And then you'll give us some good answers that the rest of the people can work on because a lot of the people who don't look like me, white people, um, got, get their um, answers from um, ancestral, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, God, Bruce, <laughs> black guy, Jesus Christ, don't, don't talk to him, don't, don't hang out with him, don't, don't do nothing with him, you know. And, um, and the way they were raised, it's hard to, like I say, teach the old dog new tricks, you know, it's as hard as hell to do, you know, and that's for anybody. And um, it's hard to change the way you were brought up, you know, you know great, great, great grandmother, father. I'm not blaming no great, great, great grandfather, but the, the things that they learned from their parents or ancestrals and the things that they, their beliefs are, um, is just embedded in within them. That's them. That's in their bloodline. That's that's how they are. And how are you gonna change that? How are you gonna really do that? It's, you know, it's hard. So you just gotta. It's it's ways you gotta do things. You gotta do the education piece. You gotta let people understand. Like do um like if you're gonna do like a training around um diversity, equity, and inclusion, you gotta learn about the person that you that's primarily what this is about. Who is about, and it's about me, a person like me, like me, about a BIPOC. Um, you have to do role plays. You got honest people got to understand about why I'm doing like this. Why, why am I wearing my hat to the side? You know I mean, well, you know, I mean, coming from South Side Chicago, you know, you know, blah blah blah. You know, why I do the things I do. Why, why I did to do. Why did I do the things that I did? You know, they, you know, they gotta learn that. You know, they gotta look at me uh, objective and not just mental. First and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, for one reason, another reason why that's kind of hard, because I don't live next door to white people. Well, man, I think I do. Probably I do, because <laughs> it's 0.1 percent. <laughs> I live next to a white person. I do. You're in Winooski, and uh, that's white is people there. Our, our <laughs> most diverse community in the state, I believe. So. <laughs> well, so I live next to white. But anyways, so like most, a lot of people don't go to, don't live next door to them, don't go to church with them, didn't go to school with them, not hanging out at the mall with them, don't walk down the street with them. And so, how are you going to get to know a person like me? How are you going to get to know a person like me? You'll see me on TV. You'll see me read me in a magazine, the newspaper. You'll hear about me. Um, Oprah Winfrey might say something nice about me, you know. But you're not going to really know much about me. Probably how, what you think about me is something that you learn from your ancestral, something that you, that you know. Look at the black people's neighborhood. Look at um, look how they raise their kids. You know, you don't see nothing, you know, like some really popular cool mm -hmm. thing. You might see a lot. You see a lot of that in Vermont because. You know, it's a good, cool thing to show things about somebody doing well in Vermont as a person of color because our numbers. But um, so that's how, so it's all about the education. And so to me, I think they can save their money by hiring, well, unless you're going gonna, unless you're gonna to hire a person who have life experience, and I got plenty of life experience on justice, equity, diversion, and inclusion. Plenty. That's all. That's my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I still do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's all I do. You know what I mean? That's, that's all the boards and, and committees and commissions I sit on right today here in Vermont. That's all I do. And so I'm better than nobody, but I can, I can at least give you a good story. I can at least come up with a program. I can at least come up with um, ways that you can understand me and, you can, you know, and, and maybe com compete with some of your, um, your thinking about how you were raised. I'm like, I, if I give you a, if I, you know, if I give you a, 
stereo uh, Rico about role plays about me and the things that I've done in my life and p why people like me act the way we do or things that some are, or a lot of other people who act, who are of not of, who are of color who will tell you about their um, heritage, why they were determined, and why they, you know, you just learn those things. You don't, you're not really, um, you know, changing your, how you were brought up, but you're just uh, you're amending to the following. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, oh, that's why they, Bruce do that. That's why he, you know, you know, he, you know, he does that, or they do this, and they, you know, they do that. And so that's what we want. That's what I want people to understand. That's what the first part to learn why people are who they are. You know, oh. And you know how housing can help <laughs> is because to create those communities. Because if you're not invited on Bruce's cable talk show, then you know you may not have an opportunity to meet Bruce and talk with him. But another way that you know, I see the institutions like VHFA can help is by ensuring that we have affordable housing in every part of Vermont, even you know, down by the waterfront in Burlington and in Shelburne and in you know, some of these towns, and making sure that we have mixed income, integrated communities like Winooski, I think is a prime example, where you know, they really are walking the walk of welcoming um, new Americans, but also a lot of folks, and, and it's working. The school district, I've heard, does a wonderful job mm -hmm. at trying to be very welcoming. Yep. And so I can't single-handedly uh, overcome oh, oh, all on, that you on, were just uh, mentioning, um, but, I can say, oh. but I can say that I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us who, especially in leadership positions, to look at what our job is and to figure out, so what can we do with that? You know, if I run essentially a housing bank, then what can I do? I can put my money there. And that's, you know, invest in things. And that's important. Whoever run I should know this, I'll get in trouble. Whoever runs the transit authority, you know, Green Mountain Transit or whatever, I hope they're asking that question of themselves about what they can do to create that sense of community and safety and conversation, things like that. I hope that all the nonprofits, CVOEO and the rest, are asking themselves, what can we do to try to create that environment for dialogue and connection? I hope that, you know, the governor's office and all the different groups, you know, if you're working on climate change issues or economic development, if you're a small business owner, what are you doing? It's going to need right. all of right. us, sure, you know, sure. we all have to band together to, to set this up and be successful. Well, just, just so you know, I, I am on um, I'm a Green Mountain Transit um, um, Justice Equity Diversion Board. Of course you are. That shouldn't <laughs> surprise me. <laughs> so we meet every month. Our next meeting is April 7th at, at um, noon of 1.30 yeah. at down at their main office if you want to show up and, and um, just hear what we talk about. So it's a, it's a lot of us, and we uh, have great ideas about how we're going to Help and that's important. This. Every, I say industry, but every individual needs to be asking themselves, what are they doing to try to create that educational opportunity, that ability to connect? You know, we like to, in housing, we like to create community spaces, community gardens, things like that, so that there's an opportunity for people to cross paths and see folks who look different that from them, but also then have a chance to sit and, and spend some time in that community space yeah. and connect. So let's talk about one more thing, and then you can actually say anything you like. Um, after, you know, you can say anything you want, anyways. Because you're gonna say anything you want, anyway. I really am. I think you know that. You know that. That's good, though. That's good. <laughs> but so let's talk about my different. Cause I had um. Well, first of all, on this show, I had um. Taisha Green, um, Yasmin, and I had uh, 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 Aaron McGuire to come, to, they're all equity directors in, in, around the, SS Burlington and Winooski. And my girl, Taisha Green, resigned. God, because she used the word not, you know, she, this wasn't appropriate for her. You know, this, this, she used the words, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't quote her what the word she used because I'm not going to, I don't, can't remember. But I know that they, um, she left uh, yesterday or something, her whole staff left, everybody left too. So, what, you know, she was very, she was dedicated, she was smart, and she, she meant, she, she was doing the work. Mm -hmm. And she was getting people involved. When she did the Juneteenth event in four different locations, they had like thousands of people out there. All, I don't think, I haven't seen so many people of color in 
since I've been in Vermont, probably. I've and heard I, that from others, yeah. And she's very powerful. She's very powerful. And and people who are non non people of color, which is incredible, who believe in just whatever they believe in, how they can make things, how they can help out for themselves. It's not about how I'm gonna help Bruce out. No. It was a it was a cross sector. I know bank presidents who were there. I know a lot of families that were there. It it really was yeah. very powerful. Yeah, and so it, was, it wasn't about, oh, let's it was about let's support this event, the meaning of what Juneteenth meant and also um, what they mean to them. See, that's the main thing, how it means to you, and how can I get, make myself better, as, or as a white, if, if I was a white person talking, uh, how can I make myself better based on what uh, I can do? And then we're not saying being, everything is rocket scientist, but you start off at elementary, you know, like you were saying, like, you know, when we started, we're not gonna move so fast, we're gonna make sure that we get it right first, you know, let's, let's, let's listen and get the steps right. And, um, and so, that's, that's all I ask the people to do is believe in what you, what do you want the most from um, to get things better with people who look like me? How do you, how can you help? What's your, you know, so you might think, okay, that's elementary, but when you do it, it's rocket science. Mm -hmm. So that's all. And so they had all those people there. Everybody was there. I'm, I've seen so many people that I knew who knew, or who knew me and I was hanging out with the mayor. He was there and um, people in performances and some real, some some little gangsters out there that I knew trying to work with them to get their life. You know, I know good I know food. Food, right. So the good thing about it, I I I was I was I'm excited when I get to see all the people I work with, you know, I'm trying to help them with their goals, you know. And so um and just um it was a beautiful days too. Mm. God. And I went to the one in um Essence and um Winusica was part of those in that one in Burlington too. So um so what do you so what do you think about her? Um, I don't know if you knew what her platform was while she was leaving or any of those things. I just know what I've read in the papers. Yeah. So I haven't talked yeah. to her directly. I mean, I messaged her mm -hmm. best wishes, and she yeah. told me what her plans were in Minnesota. Yeah. But um, I, you know, I don't know the backstory on that, so I'd never want to, you know, yeah. speak on her behalf sure. or anyone else who's doing this. But now I want to know what you thought really about about, her, about a person of equity, race. She she said right here, said Bruce, don't call me no. Diversity, I'm, I'm race. She, she'll be like mm -hmm. straight up with you on that. She ain't playing. Yep. Um, but anyways, uh, <clears throat> so I want you to think, what do you think about um, that she just couldn't get along with, she, she used the word the mayor's off, mayor, Miro. So that she, that she couldn't get along with him and, and he did some things that, like I know it was something about she should have been involved with, I know this for a fact, with the police uh, negotiation mm -hmm. or reorganization or something. And then mm -hmm. she took him, her out the picture and put somebody else in it. And and uh, I, I don't know the whole specifics, and I don't know everything about it, but, I, you know, she thought it was she should have been a part of the negotiation team or part of, I think she should have been, too, it just it, with her title. But you know, he didn't allow her to do that, and then he did some other thing else, took some power for her to get some other white person to do something. You know. So I, I, um, she felt she should have been that person. If he used her budget to do it, which is just, I don't think that's right, you know, but... I um I can't wait to see you, Mero. We're gonna talk, but um, um. Uh, so I'm so I know you. So you can't really, you know, you don't really know the whole. It's situation. sad. It's sad. I uh, mean, obviously, no one wanted this outcome. I think I can guess that by what I've read in the papers. Um, I don't. This is. It's hard work. It's complicated. I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. None of these people have me on speed dial. So um. I, I just don't know what's happening, yeah. but it really does hurt the work that's going on when things like this have to happen because, um, you know, there was such momentum that was happening right. and it, it did seem so exciting. And yeah. so it's important that that come back and that everyone learns from whatever happened, grows, reflects. I mean, I'm a big reflective practitioner. I always, uh, I'll be driving home from <laughs> this and I'll be thinking about what did we talk about? How yeah. did I answer what? And not in a navel gazing kind of way, but more in a, how can I grow from this? How can I learn? What? And, and I just think that with this racial work,
that's what needs to happen after all these interactions. Each time, you know, we have a conversation and you're feeling as a white person, maybe I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. I'm uncertain about what language I should use or was this okay to say or do or, you know, am I really, um, do I have a bias in what my gut reaction was to something that happened? Those are the things we all have to reflect on and learn from and grow from and then talk about and, you know, study and things like that. So. It's a journey we're all on, but this, whew, it is a bumpy one, it yeah. looks like right now. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not mad at nobody because um, I'm, all I'm trying to say is, is you know, we, we woke up this morning, you know, so there, we still have time to get it together, you know, and get it right, you know. It's all we can do, right? Um, and also, also, too, I want to thank you very much for coming to our fundraiser at the Hotel Vermont. Man, it was so good to see you and Charlie. Great and event. My husband uh, and I had a great time. Yeah, it was wonderful. Man. Music and art, yeah. and yeah. Uh, I didn't win anything, but that's yeah, okay. That's right. um, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So you know, um, Jack Hansen Jazz. That's what we had there. Jack Hansen Jazz. He's a city councilor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a small town. <laughs> he, he, he Come played, on. We, we have him play for all our events. You know. Yeah. He'd be gentleman too. He'd be having a great time. Um, and we we appreciate. It. We got a lot of events coming up. Like I was saying about April twenty second with the um, CBOEO, the art um, fair housing art show mm -hmm. at the. Um, Contours Auditorium. So we'll invite you to those things to come and, and we used to tell your team to show up and it's a free event. It's all free. Everything is going to be free. Maybe we should, um, you know, we'll talk. I think um, Justice is going to talk to you about having like, some resources there mm -hmm. so we can, because uh, we want the community. It's not just uh, come and enjoy this art and blah, 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 but here's some resources you should know about as well. So. Yeah, fair housing is so important. I love how Jess Hyman at CVOEO has always promotes so strongly that April is fair housing month because fair housing is one of these issues that does affect all of us. We all, whether you're applying for a loan or you're trying to rent an apartment or something in between, uh, we don't know enough, I don't think, people don't know enough about what protections are in place. You know, they say, oh, they wouldn't take me because of my Section 8 voucher. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not legal. You know, they they told me that, you know, families don't mm -hmm. do well here. That's not legal to say, you know. And um, so it's it's important that we all learn more about fair housing. I know that they're always teaching me new things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you're way home, driving home, you know, you be thinking, what, should I, what did I say? What did I... What did I learn? Just know that you 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 gave all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't gave no answers. You gave all the answers. So you should, sometimes I had to look at the shows myself and say, what the hell did I say? But I'm sometimes, like one show I did, I was like, ah, I said this event is like 5 o'clock. And I said, and, um, I said, I don't know if it's 5 or 6. I said, but whatever it is, if it's 5 or 6, I'm going to change it to the time I said. <laughs> That's a good thing about, you know, about being in charge of something. You can You can make it work, you know. But what else you got to add before we close out right now? Uh, the last thing I'll say is that VHFA is running um, a big mortgage assistance yeah, program yeah. called the Homeowner Assistance Fund. And so there's $50 million available for people who have overdue mortgages, utilities, property taxes, or homeowner association fees. So if you own your home in Vermont, and you're behind on any of those bills, you can go to vhfa.org and um, apply for that money. Similarly, another organization has a rental assistance program that's doing the same thing if you're a renter. So these kind of programs that came about since COVID and, and are federally funded and supported by our congressional delegation are so important because there's money available to help people. So I just always want to make sure that folks know that that assistance is Well, that's great. That's a lot. Jeez, yeah. Chris. Yeah. We should be on that like nothing. Yeah, yeah. This uh, has been fun. This is yeah, great, thank though. You, thank you so much Collins. for having me on, Bruce. No doubt about it. You know, we... we we finally got it right. Well, I got it right. See, I, I got one thing right. <laughs> you got everything else right. It's so I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Straight Talk Vermont Show, and we'll see you next time.